Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this video, I want to talk about the very, very important notion of free resolutions in homological algebra. And one way to think about what this notion does for you is it collates all the syzygy information that we saw in Hilbert's syzygies theorem. Okay, so let's start with the first notion that we need to introduce, that of exact sequences. And one way to think about exact sequences is if you know about complexes, it's a complex with no or trivial uh, homology or cohomology. Okay, so let's go through the definition. We'll work in the setting of modules over some ring R. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a sequence of R modules, mi, mi plus 1, mi plus 2, and so forth. It's possibly infinite, but maybe it stops somewhere. Okay. So these are modules, and in between you have R linear maps between them like that. Okay. So the first thing to define is what it means to be exact at one of these modules in this sequence. So suppose at this module here. Okay. To be exact at mi plus 1, it means that the kernel of this map here, di plus 1, is equal to the image of this one here. Okay. That's what it means to be exact at mi plus 1. Okay, so before going on, it's a good idea to connect this with this notion of complexes. Okay, so firstly, since the kernel of this contains the image of that, when you map from here to here, you land at the image, and this is inside the kernel, so when you map to here, you get zero. So if you compose from to the left of where you're exact here, to over two maps to the right, you'll get zero. So that's the situation when you talk about complexes and you can talk about cohomology. So here you have, in fact, that the kernel equals the image. Okay? If the kernel contains the image, then the, that's the same as the composite of these two being zero. Okay. And what does it mean for the whole sequence to be exact? It means that at each of these modules, it's going to be exact. Okay, so it may seem like a bit of a funny definition to start off with, but let me give you the stereotypical example of what's going on. Okay, so here we just have a module M and a submodule N. And then we're going to get this three term exact sequence. Okay, so you're going to have the modules N, M, and the quotient M over N. And the maps between them are just the inclusion map from N into M. And then also you have the quotient map from M to M over N, which sends any element M to the coset of N containing M with M as a representative. Okay, so let's just check that this is exact, okay? So to check that it's exact, the only time this makes sense, of course, is at this module here in the middle M. So we just need to check that the kernel of this map here is equal to the image of the inclusion map here. Okay, so what is the kernel of this map here? Of course, it's the quotient map. So the kernel is just uh, the submodule N, which of course is just the image of that, and that's exactness. So one example that we have is the module you get from looking at the quotient of a module by a submodule. Okay, so the next definition that I want to look at uh, involves a very special case of this, and this is in some ways the most important case. So that's the notion of a short exact sequence, which I'll abbreviate to SES. And basically, that's just an exact sequence of the following form here. Okay, so it's got five modules. The ones on the ends are both zero, and then you'll have three in the middle, M prime, M here, M double prime, and there are your R linear maps in between them. Okay, so let's have a look and see precisely what this means to be exact, okay? Because we can say a lot more about what's going on. Okay, so to say that this is exact really, it means it's exact at M prime, M, and at M double prime. Okay, so here you can't talk about exactness because there's no map going out, and here you can't talk about exactness because there's no map going in. Okay, so what does it mean to be exact at M prime? Okay, so that's the first thing we'll look at, and that's part A here. What's that mean? Okay, so let's look. You want the kernel of this map here to equal the image of this map here. But the image of this is zero, so that just means the kernel of this D prime is zero. The kernel being zero just means it's, it's an injective map. So being exact at M prime means precisely the fact that this D prime, this map here, is injective. Okay, so let's have a look at exactness on this side, M double prime here, okay? So what's that mean, okay? So here, you look at the kernel of this map here is the same as the image of this one here. And the zero tells you a lot about the kernel. The kernel is just the whole of this. So since the kernel equals the image, the image of this is the whole of M double prime. If the image of this D double prime is all of M double prime, it just means that D double prime is surjective. So exactness of the M double prime just means that D double prime is surjective. So to get a short exact sequence just means that you have an injective map here. 
a surjective map here and the kernel of this d double prime equals the d prime. Okay, so when we look at the, uh, this exactness at here, we can use the first isomorphism theorem to give you a way of um, understanding what that means as well. And that will tell you a little bit about what's going on, okay? So let's apply the first isomorphism theorem to this d double prime, okay? So what does the first isomorphism to theorem tell you? It tells you that the image of a homomorphism, so here m double prime, so you've got the m double prime here, you can write that as isomorphic to a quotient. And what's the question of? It's the question of the domain, which is m here, by the kernel of this map. So the kernel of this map, though, by exactness, you can write out now in terms of this one here. It's the image of this d prime. So it's uh, isomorphic to m modulo the kernel of this, which is the image of that. That's d prime of m prime. So basically, this m double prime is the quotient of m by d prime of m prime. Okay, it's isomorphic. And the isomorphism is induced by d double prime. Okay, and note that d prime here is injective. So using this d prime, you can actually identify m prime with its image inside here. Okay, so one way to think about this short exact sequence, okay, is really what is it doing, okay? In many ways, it's just, it's not really a new notion, okay? It's really recasting the notion of a quotient in different language. Okay, so how is it recasting the notion of a language? Firstly, this m double prime is essentially m mod m prime. The only thing is that it's not equal in the sense that this is a set of cosets of this. You need this isomorphism here that's induced by d double prime. Okay, and the other thing is that, um, of course, you can't do m modular m prime because m prime might not be a submodule of m. However, if you use this d prime to identify it with a um, submodule of m, it is that quotient up to the isomorphism induced by d double prime. Okay, so really, this short exact sequence is a different way of expressing uh, the notion of quotient module. Okay, so this third term is the quotient of this by this one here, but it's got a little bit more flexibility, so and it's a little bit more general because you've got a map here, d double prime, so then it has to be isomorphic to that quotient, and really, you can't really form a quotient of m by m prime uh, because this is only isomorphic to some submodule. Okay, but you're using this to, to say which. Um, sub-module that is okay so that's rather nice so in fact uh, this in many ways gives you a complete understanding of short exact sequences if you understand uh, the quotient module construction okay so the reason why we need to use this new language will be hopefully clear later it has a lot more flexibility okay so we've seen the flexibility already in the sense that uh, you can replace quotients by things isomorphic to it and also some modules by things isomorphic to it but the other flexibility we'll see in this notion known as splicing which is very interesting so let me show you that okay so now we're going to consider two exact sequences a and b which has a very special form the first one a is going to end with a zero and I'll just set up the notation so you go from m minus 2 to m minus 1 to this omega to 0. And the second one, b, will start with a 0. And the first term after that will be the omega, the same as this one here. So 0 goes to omega, and that goes to m0, goes to m1. And what you can do is you can sort of splice them together. You can snip off this uh, omega and the 0 bit. You snip off the omega 0 bit, and you can join them together to get a uh, sequence of this form, m minus 2 to m minus 1, that's the same as before. And now we're going to jump from this m minus 1 to this m0, and how do we do that? We apply the d minus 1 prime first, and then we apply this d minus 1 double prime to get all the way to m0, and then get to m1. And what's interesting is that, in fact, in this case, this is still exact, okay, when you splice these two exact sequences together in this way. It's still exact. Okay, so let's see why that's true. Okay, so let's look at, so they, this can go further back if you like. So if you're m minus 2 or back further, if you want to check that this is indeed exact, basically it's just checking the exactness here because the terms um, are the same as the ones over here. Okay, so uh, that gives you exactness for m minus 2 and any one that's before that. So let's look at the terms after m1. Okay, um, if you want to look at the terms m1 and onwards, if you want to check that they're exact, you just have to check what's going on here. So here, I guess I haven't got a, um, I don't have anything, but if there were extra ones, you can check that too, that they're exact. So the only two places you need to exact are at m minus 1 and at m0. 
Okay, so let's just check that and see how this setup allows you to check exactness here. So what we want to show is that the kernel of this composite map, okay, from here to here, here to here, so it's d minus one prime, d minus one, uh, d minus one prime first, and then d minus one double prime. The kernel of that it, um, is equal to the image of this d minus two. Okay. So the key thing to note here is that this d minus one prime, that's this one here, is injective, right? Because remember what exact this here means. So because of the zero here, as we saw above, it just means that this is an injective um, homomorphism. Okay, so that's injective. So that's since that's injective, okay, it doesn't do anything. Uh, it doesn't increase the size of the kernel when you put that at the end. Okay, when you go from here to here to here to here, the things get sent to zero are precisely the things that got mapped to zero inside here. So the kernel is just the kernel of this map. So what's the kernel of this map? It's just the image of this d minus 2. And that's what we're supposed to show to get exactness here. And similarly, you can show exactness at m0. Let's just run through quickly. You want to show that the image of this composite, d minus 1 double prime, d minus 1 prime, is equal to the kernel of this map here. And now what do you use? You need to show that, uh, use the fact that this here is exact at omega. So this map, d minus 1 prime, is uh, surjective. This is surjective. Okay, so to look at the image from here to here to here, okay, uh, since this is surjective, you just need to look at the um, image from here to here, the image of d minus 1 uh, double prime, and of course that's just the kernel of d0. So you get exactness at this m0 as well, and hence uh, you get a nice spliced exact sequence. Okay, so that's how uh, maybe the ones that you start off with um, are just these short exact sequences like that. But notice that if you have two short exact sequences, where well, you have something which ends in a zero here, and you'll have another one which begins with a zero, so you can start splicing to get longer exact sequences. And what's nice about this is that actually you can reverse the procedure. So suppose instead you have a nice longer exact sequence like this one, uh, you don't care how it starts and ends, but suppose you go from m minus 2 to m minus 1 to m0 to m1. What you can do is at any uh, point in the middle, you can break it up into an A and a B like this. Okay, so let me just show you how to do that. So you basically reverse the argument and you just need to know what the omegas are that you need to put inside. Okay? So suppose you want to break it up here. So you have uh, this part here. What's your omega? So I claim what you can pick for omega is you make it the kernel of this d0. And since this is exact at m0, the kernel of d0 is equal to the image of d minus 1. So you set omega equal to kernel of d0, which is the image of d minus 1. And let's just see what the maps that you get here are, okay? So of course you would need to map m minus 1 to this omega. Well this uh, omega is just the image of d minus uh, image of d minus 1. So this m minus 1 does map to the, uh, the image of d minus 1, which is omega. So you can build this. And of course since it's the image of this d minus 1, it is surjective here. Similarly, you need to uh, build this part of the sequence. So how does omega map to m0? What is omega? Omega is also the kernel of this map here. So since it's the kernel, you can embed the kernel into this M0. Embed this kernel omega into M0. Embedding omega into M0. Since it embeds, it's injective, it's exact here, and you can have an exact sequence of this form. So this is the opposite of slicing. You uh, break up this into two exact sequences like that. We can now finally give the definition of a free resolution of some R module M. Okay, and basically it's just an exact sequence of this form. We have m on the end, okay, like that, going to zero. So this map is a subjection from f zero to m, and we continue this exact sequence like this. And all of these f's here are free R modules. Okay, so how do you get such a free resolution? In fact, there's an algorithm for constructing one, and basically we saw it in that video on Hilbert Syzygy's theorem. Okay, so let me remind you how to do it. We did it in a special case where we also looked at graded free resolutions, but actually works in general. So let's start with our module M. We need to construct the first bit, so a, a surjection from some free module onto that. How do we get that? Well, it's quite simple. All we do is we just pick some set of generators for M, okay, and as small as you like, or it could be all of M if you like, and you pick for this free module just one copy of R for each generator. And so for each copy of R, the unit there you map to that generator, and that gives you a, a surjective map from a free module to your module M. And then how do you construct this module omega 1M here? Remember what this is, this first syzygy? It's just the kernel of that map. And since it's the kernel, you've expressed uh, this as a quotient of this 
by this. So you get a short exact sequence like that. And of course, uh, that gives you the first part. And how do you keep going? Well, what you do now, you can now repeat the procedure with omega 1m. Look at generators for that, and hence construct a free module F1, which surjects onto this. Its kernel will give you the second syzygy. Okay, so this may be free. If it's free, actually, you can kind of stop there. Okay, but otherwise, you keep repeating, and you get a whole sequence of short exact sequences, where the middle term here is always free. Okay, and now what can you do? You can splice because this one begins with a zero and this one ends with a zero and there's a common term here that's an omega 1m and an omega 1 here. So we can go straight from this f1 all the way across to this f0, f1 to f0 and continue it on here to f0 to m to 0. And that's exact. And then if you have another one where you have a short exact sequence of omega 2 here, you can splice from this f2 going to f1 and so forth and continue to get a free resolution. Okay, so splicing gives you free resolution, and this technique here gives a free resolution of some R module M. Okay, so let's see how we can use this information, and I'll show you one interesting example that crops up, okay? And this occurs when you look at what I've called additive functions. This isn't a completely uh, standard terminology, but it's a useful one. We're going to start with an abelian group A, okay? And we're going to look at functions, um, so basically where we input finitely generated R modules, or perhaps finitely generated graded R modules, as the case may be, if R is graded, and the values will be inside A. Okay, so I've written it rather loosely here as a set of these finitely generated. Of course, I shouldn't really be talking about sets. Okay, so but let's suppose, yeah, you have some um, thing which assigns to every finitely generated graded R module some element of this abelian group. Okay. So we're going to introduce this definition here for what it means for this function chi to be additive. Okay? So that means that if you're given any short exact sequence of these finitely generated R modules, or, or graded, if you're looking in the graded setting here, okay? suppose you have such a short exact sequence, chi of the middle term, okay, which is in some abelian group, is equal to the chi of the first term, m prime, plus chi of the last term, chi of m double prime. Okay? So that's what it means by additive. So that the middle one, the chi of the middle one, is the sum of the chi's of the outer terms. Another way to express it is, remember, this is a short exact sequence. And so uh, essentially, you're saying that m double prime is, morally speaking, just a quotient of m by m prime, okay, in the manner that I described before. So up to some isomorphism here, and also you need to identify m prime with some submodule of m using this map here, okay? So what happens in that case? Then the chi of this m double prime, chi of this quotient, is equal to the chi of the ambient space here, chi of m, minus the chi of the submodule. Chi of the quotient equals chi of the big one minus chi of the submodule. Okay, which is a nice formula that you might expect to happen in certain cases. Okay, so what happens if uh, you know you have an added function? That's the definition part. The proposition is that suppose now we're given a free resolution, as you see here, okay? And suppose further that this resolution stops in the sense that after a while it's just all zeros, okay? When you just have a row of zeros, that will automatically give you an exact sequence, okay? Uh, because the kernels and the images, they're all equal to subgroups of zero, so the zero has to equal zero. The kernel has to image e equal the image because they're both zero. Okay, so you can have a row of zeros that will always give you an exact sequence. And let's suppose uh, you have a free resolution in that form. Okay, in that case, you can write down the chi of m. Okay, so in other words, chi of m can be computed from chi of the free resolution. And how's that? Well, you look at the chi of f0, and then you subtract the chi of f1, and then add the chi of f2, and so on. You come get, make this alternating sum, and eventually you get to chi of zeros, and you can show quite easily that this condition here forces chi of 0 equal to 0. So this is actually only just some finite alternating sum. Okay, so let's just do the quick proof for why this is true, okay? So suppose you want to compute what is chi of this m, okay? Chi of this m is just chi of this f0 minus chi of this first syzygy, okay? But this chi of this first syzygy, you can work from this short exact sequence, it's just this chi of f1 minus chi of the second syzygy. So chi of m is equal to chi of f0 minus this difference. So it's chi of f0 minus chi of f1, and then you uh, have to subtract the negative of the chi of this. So you have to add in that. But this omega 2, now you can work out in terms of f2. Okay, And if you go, uh, proceeding in that way, 
uh, by going down all these uh, sequences here. So remember, when you have this free resolution, we can break it up into these short exact sequences. And applying induction on this, we get this alternating sum here. Okay, so that's rather nice. You have this free resolution here. Okay, if you want to work out what chi of this um, object is here, uh, you can do it from looking at the chi of these uh, free objects here. And the free objects, remember, they're rather fixed. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples of uh, additive functions. Okay, so suppose now R is a finite dimensional algebra over some field K, a finite dimensional K algebra. Okay, so if you have a finitely generated module, of course it has some finite dimension um, over K as well. Okay, so suppose this is a sequence now of modules over this R, this finite dimensional K algebra. You can look at the dimensions of this over K. And to be an exact sequence, of course, in particular, this will be an exact sequence of vector spaces. So M will be just the direct sum of the vector space M double prime and M prime, at least as a vector space over K, even if the R module structure is not a uh, direct sum. Okay, so since that's the case, the dimension of the M is the same as the dimension of M double prime plus the dimension of M prime, and that's additivity. Okay, now of course you can do a similar thing, suppose you're in a graded setting and you look at modules over some graded algebra like, well let's fix in this case, the polynomial ring in D variables over the field K. Okay, so that's a graded algebra graded by degree, and you look at, look at graded modules and you can talk about the Hilbert series. These Hilbert series are inside basically their generating functions, so they will uh, be um, series in T and T inverse, and they will have coefficients inside Z. Okay, so this is an abelian group. Okay, this A is an abelian group, and uh, this Hilbert series will map uh, finitely generated graded R modules to this group here. And basically, the coefficients of T just tell you the dimensions in each graded component. So, of course, uh, you see that since the dimension is additive, okay, so uh, that follows from the fact that the dimension of a direct sum is the sum of the dimensions, okay, working on each degree, we can see that the Hilbert series is also additive. Okay, so to show you how you use this sort of thing and to show some of the relationships that this idea brings to you, I want to have a look at a very interesting uh, free resolution, okay. So, suppose now this D equals 2, so we're looking at just the polynomial ring R in two variables, and I'll now call them X and Y. Okay. And the module that I want to have a look at is the following one here. It's a quotient of R. It's a graded quotient of R. I'm just looking at the ideal generated by X and Y. So they're both in degree 1. And so when you uh, factor that out, all you have left is a copy of K, and that's sitting inside degree 0. Okay, So that's what I'm going to look at, just this uh, module here, this quotient module here. I want to find a free resolution for that, and we can do it using this idea here. Okay, so first we have a surjection from this free, and uh, it's kind of constructed that way. And then you look at the kernel, and the kernel, of course, is generated by x and y. Since it's generated by x and y in the degree 1, you can take the a surjection from two copies of kxy, but since they're in degree 1, you have to shift them by 1. So they uh, shift to uh, minus 1 here, and you've got two copies of them. Okay, and the subjective map onto this kernel is given by where you subject it onto, uh, uh, onto x and y. So basically, this is if you think of elements inside here as just column vectors, what this map is is it's just left multiplication by x, y. So, in other words, if you have here an element is just f, g, two polynomials like that, okay, what this map is, you just left multiply by um, x, y. So uh, this gets sent to okay, x, y times f, g, which is just x, f plus y, g. Okay. So that gives you a uh, map, and now it's surjective up to here, and you want to look at what's the kernel of this. Okay. Well, so what are polynomials in x and y? f and g, which get mapped to 0 under this map here. Okay, So, of course, it's quite easy to sh see that if you put f equal to the polynomial minus y and g equal to x, that goes towards 0. Okay, You can do this just by multiplying this matrix by this one here. Okay, So if you multiply them together, you get x times minus y is minus xy plus yx, so that gives you 0. Okay, And in fact, it turns out that everything inside the kernel of this map has to be a scalar multiple of this. I won't go through this check, but it's actually quite a good exercise, and it's not difficult. 
So that actually generates the kernel. And since it generates the kernel, you can subject onto that with just one copy of uh, KXY. But now this has to be in one degree lower again. So this is going to be KXY shifted by 2 backwards. So it's uh, KXY shifted minus 2 like that. Okay, so that's what we have. Now, uh, this is actually an injection. It's quite easy to see. Okay, so what this means is that you send any polynomial to the polynomial times this vector here. So that's the thing that you have there. And it's quite easy to see that's injective. So you've got a zero going here. And you can keep going by just adding zeros. Okay, since this is injective, you can put a zero maps here. The kernel of this is a zero. And that's equal to the image of that, which is zero. And so forth. Just add zeros all the way to the end. So we're in this situation where this free resolution terminates in the sense that you have zeros uh, once you go far enough out. In fact, you just have to go zeros from here. Okay, so that means that we can use the, this uh, proposition here. Okay, If we want to calculate the Hilbert series, for example, of this module here, uh, we can do it using the Hilbert series of all these three things here. Okay, What we're going to do actually is quite, simp uh, quite the reverse. Okay, It turns out that the um, Hilbert series of this module here is easy to work out. And though we've worked out what the Hilbert series of the polynomial ring is, and it's not too difficult, this will actually also give us an alternative way to calculate the Hilbert series of the polynomial ring, which is very, very interesting. Okay, And you'll see what's going on. Okay, so firstly, what is the Hilbert series of this module K here? Okay, so basically, what is that module? Okay, it's just a one-dimensional module, and that one dimension sits in side degree zero. Okay, so in degree zero, so the coefficient of t to the zero is one. Okay, but in all other degrees, it's going to be the zero, so the dimension of that is zero, so you don't have any other non-zero coefficients. All the other coefficients of t, uh, powers of t, are going to be zero. So you just get one. One equals hk of t. And we saw in this proposition here, you have this free resolution. So chi of uh, this, uh, this uh, Hilbert series of this module here, is the alternating sum of the Hilbert series of these three. So it's the Hilbert series of R here, minus the Hilbert series of uh, two copies of R minus one, plus the Hilbert series of R shifted by minus two. And that's your answer. Okay, that's what you get. But the thing is that these are actually easy to calculate. Okay, So what's the Hilbert series of this? So firstly, the um, Hilbert series of direct sum is just the sum of the Hilbert series. So it's twice the Hilbert series of r minus 1. And we also have shifting. Okay, So what is the Hilbert series of r minus 1? It's related to, to the Hilbert series of r by just multiplication by t. So this is just minus 2t okay, hr of t, the Hilbert series of uh, r. Here you've just got one copy of r minus 2. By shifting, this is just t squared times the Hilbert series of r. So here we have, in each of these terms, the Hilbert series of r. So we can pull that out. And what we find here is that uh, the fact that we have coming out here is just 1 minus 2t plus t squared, which is just 1 minus t all squared. So what we've seen here is that using this free resolution, we've written this Hilbert series of this k, which is quite easy, it's just 1 as the Hilbert series R times some polynomial 1 minus t squared. So 1 minus 2t plus t squared. And where do the numbers come from? The 1 is just because you have one copy of R here. The 2t, so the t comes from the fact that you've shifted by uh, 1 here, and the 2 comes from that. And the t squared comes from the fact that you've shifted by 2 here. Okay, So those uh, pieces of data inside the free resolution is giving you this uh, factor out the front. And now you can have this rather interesting computation of what the Hilbert series of this uh, polynomial ring in the variables x and y is. What's the Hilbert series of uh, this r here? All you need to do is you just need to divide by this 1 minus t squared over to this side to get this h r of t. And it's just 1 on 1 minus t squared. So that's a really, really neat way of getting at the Hilbert series of this R. And this is a very, very important relationship, so a way to compute it, which is very different from other ways, which gives you more information. Sometimes you can use this to find information about free resolutions. Sometimes you know about free resolutions and you can use that to tell you information about Hilbert series. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics. <laughs>